Jim Weber. You only got 68 minutes, Jim. Uh, thank you. Thanks to uh, uh, Dale for reminding me how much time I have. There's, a, there's an old saying, the mind can only receive what the seed can endure. <laughs> so it's great to see you all today. And, uh, and um, I, uh, like I say, like I said earlier, we, I, we have a, a great long-standing relationship with this church and um, I love coming here and, and I want to say too is I love the way the sanctuary looks and the way the outside of the building looks and, and uh, you guys are doing a great job uh, just fantastic uh, just a couple of announcements you know I'm a pastor I always have to have announcements but uh, we're not taking an offering I think you already did that but uh, uh, we are uh, there's a couple of things uh, just to give you a little update about KCF we moved into a new building we, the Lord has allowed us to buy a, uh, just about an acre of land downtown Nelson. And uh, it's 0.9 of an acre, just, just under, just shy of an acre. And it's right right across from the Best Western Hotel, right in the heart, right in the center of Baker Street there. So we were pretty excited about that. And, um, and so, uh, and you know, God has allowed us to buy this building. And the building is a 15,000 square foot building, has a bowling alley in the basement. <laughs> And um, it has a, a SPCA in one corner. So with the rent that we get from the SPCA in the bowling alley, it, we're actually uh, mortgage neutral just about. $100 short of mortgage neutral. So, it, you know, here we, you know, it's amazing, isn't it? How God can do things. And uh, you just got to believe God and uh, trust and walk in, in what he's showing you. And so uh, we just moved in. We've been, on, been there for four weeks. And... Uh, and so uh, it was a little hectic to get away from Nelson to come out, but uh, we wanted to do it. And uh, we are, we're still operating our daily bread. And uh, so we, we serve uh, around 50 to 75 people every day, uh, the homeless and the poor, for lunch. And uh, so we're doing that in our new building. And uh, that's working out. So we're, we're excited about that. One thing that I would like to invite uh, you folks out to, and that is, is that... Uh, we have family camp out at uh, Ryan Dell. And uh, has anybody from this church been to Ryan Dell at Dutch Harbor, to Dutch Harbor Camp? Just uh, wave your hand there. There's one person in the back. All right. Yeah. So there's a, there's a person of contact right there. You can go talk to him and, and say, how was it? E Ryan Dell is a beautiful place on the lake. Uh, Dutch Harbor is just, it's right on the lake. Uh, it's very inexpensive uh, to come our camp in a way. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, brochures and registration. If you go to Kootenai Christian Fellowship uh, to our website, and uh, you'll see there a cap brochure, and we'd love to have you come along. The key thing, though, is, is that we can only take 70 people. So if you want to come, you need to let us know as soon as possible so you don't get left out. And uh, uh, our guest speaker will be Roland Falk this year. And uh, anybody who ever had Roland heard him speak, you'll be blessed uh, to hear him. And so we run a little different camp than other camps. Uh, our family, we, we feel that, you know, sometimes you go to a Christian camp and, and a Bible camp and, and, and they got a morning meeting, they got an afternoon meeting, they got an evening meeting. By the time you're all done, you're so tired, you wish you, wish you hadn't come. We have one meeting a day and we have a devotional in the evening. And uh, so we do some worship, and we, we're going to hear Roland speak. But the rest of the day is free time. Right, right. And what, are the, what are the days here? Uh, July the uh, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, and we go home on the 12th. So it's Monday, July Monday, through to the Friday, we go home on Friday. Check and, in Monday afternoon. Yeah, we check in Monday noon, afternoon, like from noon on. And uh, it's only $10 a person per night for the yeah. cabin. No, no, I'm getting there, honey. Just relax. <laughs> uh, $13. $13. I, I love when my wife's with me because she straightens me up. <laughs> By the way, Dream, why don't you stand up? Isn't she beautiful? Come on, stand up. <laughs> she hates sitting up at the front, but I like it there because then I can see her. Um, we've, we've, been, uh, we've been married for uh, 34 years. Oh. So, there you go. 
still loves me, that's amazing. And, uh, so, um, uh, $13 a night per adult, and then uh, we charge approximately around $10 per person uh, a day for food. So, for 23 bucks a day, huh, where can you go for that? However, it's a little rustic, so uh, you got to bring your own bedding, and uh, we do have cabins there and stuff like that, but you got to bring your own uh, your bed. Is that correct, please? A band doing okay? All right. And uh, so, and you got to bring golf clubs because there's a great hey, little golf course. Put me down. Yeah, put you down. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's my announcements today. I think. Oh, and then of course the FCA convention is in October, but you. Uh, that's going to be announced this year. How many do that? Did you guys know that you've been announcing it here? Uh, we've got 57 registered already. So, uh, Fellowship of Christian Assemblies, that's uh, the fellowship we belong to. Oh, yes. Right. All right. Okay, so I think I'm ready to, to, uh, to uh, share the word of the Lord with you. So, uh, before I do, I heard this story that I, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Catholic Pope in Rome and the uh, Jewish uh, lead rabbi priest for having an argument. And, um, and the Pope got so upset, he was going to throw all the Jews out of Rome. And so they said, well, that's not a good idea. Uh, you should at least give them a chance. So the Pope said, okay, we'll have a debate. And um, if uh, the, the Jewish priest wins the debate, they can stay. If, if, if I win the debate, they got to go. So they said, okay, we'll have a debate. And so they got together, and the Jewish rabbi was there, and the Pope was there. And the only problem is, the Jewish rabbi couldn't understand Italian, and the Pope couldn't understand Yiddish. So they decided to have a silent debate. All right? And so the debate started, and the, uh, and the Pope holds up three fingers. And the Jewish uh, uh, rabbi holds up one finger. And then uh, the Pope, he goes like this. And the Jewish rabbi goes like this. And then the Pope got up, took out the, the Eucharist and the bread and the, and the cup. And so the Jewish rabbi went into his pack and got out an apple. And the Pope says, I feel humble today. The Jewish rabbi has won the debate and they can stay in Rome. Well, the Jewish rabbi goes home. All the Italian folks say to the Pope, how did it happen? How did they win the debate? Well, he said, when I held up three fingers to remind them, that there's the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My Jewish rabbi friend reminded me that yes, there are the three, but they're one in God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right? Everybody wants it. And, uh, and so, when he, uh, when the, the Italian uh, fellow said, the Pope said, when I, I said that God is all around us, my Jewish rabbi reminded me, no, but God is right here with us right now. And then when I took out my, the bread and the, and the cup to remind us of the sacrifice of Christ, he took out his apple to remind us that if it wasn't for the original sin, Christ would not have been needed. And so the Yiddish Jewish leader goes to his people and they say, how did you win the debate? He says, I have no idea. When he told me that we had three days to get out of Rome, I told him, I gave him the finger. <laughs> <laughs> and, when, and when he said, you all got to go, I said, we're staying right here. <laughs> and when he took out his lunch, I took out mine. The important thing is this. You, uh, is my slide uh, you, your slide show coming up here? I um, I got a, I got an assistant with me here today. Thanks, Josh. And um, so there's a. So you know the thing is this is that 
I believe that God wants a church to have significance in the community. Those of you who heard me preach here before I know that's the truth. That's how I believe. And the church should not exist just for ourselves. Now I think the church should uh, exist for our, our spiritual healing, and our education, and our learning. But the point is, is that that's not where it should end. Right? <laughs> because if, if that becomes the end result, then we miss the whole point. Yes. The church should have a significance in the community. And if the church is going to have significance in the community, it has to have the presence of God. Amen. Amen. It has to have the presence of God. And so today, I want to talk to you about having the presence of God in our midst. And, um, and because we want to be a church of significance. In other words, we want to be able to, we want this place, we want the place to be a place of healing. Amen? I already saw that this morning. This place should be a place of deliverance. This place should be a place of, of acceptance. This place should be a place where people can come to and not feel that uh, they're condemned when they walk in the door. This place should be a place where anyone is welcome. But most importantly, you see, because we can, we can achieve a lot of those things without God. We have to have His presence with us. And there's an interesting couple of chapters in... Uh, uh, in uh, in, in, the, in the Chronicles. Sorry, I'm just uh, learning to. Have we got it up there? Bring it back when uh, we're doing great. So in Chronicles, um, David is going to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Do you know what? Do you know why he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem? It symbolized the presence of God. And David understood something. He was a worshiper. How many know that David was a worshiper? Yeah. David was a worshiper. And David understood that he wanted, he, he understood that in, the, in worship there was the presence of God. But he also understood that in battle the, the presence of God was there. And in your, and in your everyday life you should have the presence of God. And so the, the Ark of the Covenant was not in, in Jerusalem. And he said, I've got to bring the Ark of the Covenant back in Jerusalem. And so he attempts to do that in chapter 13. And then in chapter 14, it's just, it just gets plumped in there. And then in cha and, and, but chapter 13, how many know that chapter 13 was a dismal failure? He, he didn't do so well. Right? It, it actually ended up in quite a disaster. And then, and then we have chapter 14. And if you read chapter 14, it talks about all of David's successes. It talks about his family life. And it talks about how good he's doing as king. I'm thinking, this is really funny. Why? Is chapter 14 after chapter 13. <laughs> you, ever, you ever notice that? No. I, I never noticed it either until I started studying it. Holy Spirit brought it to my attention. I thought, what? This, this just doesn't make sense. And, and I used to, you know, I've been reading the Bible now for a long time, um, since 1972. You know that? I read the Bible every single day. Every single day. I think I've missed about four or five times in, in about 30. How many years is that? 40 years? 40. 41. 43. I'm going seven years. There you go. So, you know, it's possible to do that, you know. <laughs> anyway, this chapter, this chapter 14 just didn't ever make sense to me. And then in chapter 15, he brings the Ark of the Covenant back in Jerusalem. Right? All right, are we there? Okay, so in chapter 14, and now let's just look at chapter 14 quickly, because I've got now uh, 30 minutes. You see, in chapter 14, it talks about the secret to David's success. First or second? Ch uh, chapter 14, First Chronicles. And David's talking about his dreams, and he establishes a king. He speaks of his of, of, of uh, the recognition that he has of his peers. This, I'm talking about chapter one here, and uh, he speaks of his family, his children. Then it speaks of the conflict and the battles, and and, and and how he he was able to be an overcomer amongst the Philistines. Look at verse eight. 
There's a battle going on. And they went out in full force. Just because you realize your dreams doesn't mean, you know, they, like he, he had success. And just because you realize your dream doesn't mean you're not going to have any more battles. And so in verse 8, it talks about the Philistines showing up. You know that, that, uh, that David had a lot of battles, didn't he? He had a battle with Goliath. And then he was vaulted to a leadership position. And then he had a battle with Saul. And he ran for approximately 10 years, hiding. And eventually he becomes the king. And in verse 8, it says that the Philistines came out in full force. You think, ah, I finally, my dream was finally realized. And now, why can't I just rest? <laughs> Ever feel like that? <laughs> and so, we want to learn about some lessons here about the presence of God. And so what was David's response? I want to look at three responses that David had. And you can just bring them up there for us there. Uh, thanks. He sought the Lord. He obeyed and he engaged. I believe that these are the three things that will bring the presence of God into your life and to the church. You need to seek God. You need to obey. And you have to get involved. Amen. We need to be obedient to what God has shown us. And then we have to actually do something. Faith that works is... So in verse 11, it talks about that David went up to Pe Baal Perizim, and there he defeated them. As water breaks out, God has broken out against my enemies by, by my hand, so that place is called Baal Perizim. Mike Hulak correctly points out in the sermon, Faith and Action Brings Breakthrough. He says, before the battle is seen in the scriptures called the Valley of Raphim, meaning the house of giants. After the battle is called Baal Perizim, meaning the possessor of breaches, he asks the question, why was this place renamed after Baal, a god of the Philistines and not after the Lord? He answers the question by saying, because at this place, the enemy thought he was the stronger, so David called it Baal Perizim, meaning that God broke through the strongest place of the enemy. Do you know that God wants to break through the strongest place of the enemy in your life? The very place that you find is the most difficult. That is the place that God wants to break through. Now here's the problem that we have as Christians most of the time. Is this. Is that when we sense a breakthrough in a particular area. We then catalog that thing. We analyze that, how it happened. And then we use that particular method for every other situation that comes into our life. How many know that that doesn't always work? <laughs> and so in David's case, at one time, the, he would seek the Lord. He would put in his heart to obey. And then he would do exactly what God showed him. And so when he was going to go into a battle, right? He would say, how do you want me to do this? And so God would show him. But then when another battle ensued, he wouldn't do it. Well, that worked last time, let's do it again. See, I think that's part of the problem with the churches today is that we sense God's grace and God's presence and it was awesome and God did a wonderful thing in our midst and we sensed his power and his presence and now we're still doing it 20, 30 years later. Exactly the same way. Methods change, the message stays the same. Yes. And I see this all the time. I, I, I one time I went into a church and I thought, my goodness, they're singing the exact same songs that we sang in the 1970s. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with those songs. But the world has moved on. God is doing a, a new thing. 
And, uh, and you know, it's hard sometimes to, to change. <laughs> I, I tell you what, it's hard. I, I, I remember the first time, I, I haven't, I'll tell you, I, I, I was speaking at a chapel the other day uh, for our Christian school in Nelson. And I told the kids, you know, I said, I haven't opened the Bible for three years. <laughs> and all the little kids went, oh. <laughs> Pastor Chip hasn't opened the Bible for three <laughs> years. The Bible's actually opened up. <laughs> So then I said, because I read it on my tablet. <laughs> One little kid says, that's not a Bible. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> now, those of you who don't know me, um, I have a sight impairment, and uh, so I don't see that well. So look at my kid. How many can read that from back there? <laughs> <laughs> I can read it from here. <laughs> I love this tablet. It, it, it's changed my, changed my life. I, 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 uh, I can make the font the size I want. And um, so I, 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 I love it. My point is this, saints, is let's not get caught up in what God did 20 years ago. Amen. Amen. Because those, we want to revel in that. We, we don't, we're not discounting that. But we need to seek God today. That's right. We need to have in our heart to be obedient today. And then we need to engage in what God is showing us. Amen. If we want his presence to be in our midst. And so David understood this. And so there was victory. And so in, in verse 13, once more the Philistines ran in the valley, so David inquired of God again and answered him, do not go directly after them, but circle around them this time. So in other words, there was a different way of this time. The last time worked, now God was showing David a different way to work. He didn't employ the same task. Now, let me say it again. Seek God, obey God, and action is required. Obedience to the will of God. The principle does not change, but the implementation of the principle needs to be different. So we're going to go to, um, I don't know what slide we have up there now. Oh yeah. Good, go one more. So in chapter 14, as I said earlier, he gets plumped in the middle. And so now we're down to chapter 13. Let's go back to chapter 13. So David, I want us to notice something about chapter 13. There we go. So David says, and David is very successful. And David says, you know what? We need to have God's presence. I want you to notice what he did here. Look at the scripture that we have up on the screen. David conferred with each of his officers and commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and he said to them, the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you and if it is the will of the Lord, our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of the people through the territories of the people, and all to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pastures and pasture lands to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us. For we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul, and the whole assembly agreed to this because it seemed right to all the people. Do you guys see anything wrong with this? There's something drastically wrong with what happens in these verses. 2 Samuel 6, 1. Again, David brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. Now this, I want to uh, uh, illustrate to you this morning that this was no small thing that David was doing. Can you imagine... Uh, if, like the commotion, the organization, the uh, effort that would have been involved in bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, 30,000 soldiers and, and army were there. All the young men were there. I mean, there were, and there was, and we read about it, that the band was there, and the orchestra was there, and the singers were there. I mean, and, and the food that would have been prepared, and, the, and the, all the celebration that was going on. My goodness, I'm preparing for a conference of about 150 to 200 people, and it's a lot of work. How much work would this have been? That's right. This was a big deal. So look at, let's go to the next slide here. So David consulted God, or I should say, David didn't consult God.
God, but he consulted with his officers. He said to the officers, if you think it's a good idea, isn't this a departure of David? He invited 30,000 of his finest. He invites them, he says, oh, let's, by the way, let's invite the priest. As an afterthought. In other words, what has happened in David's heart? He became successful with his army. Hey? He became successful with his army. And now his army was running the show. Hey? Boy, oh boy, we have to be careful. It seemed right. Can you just go back? Go back one slide. And it, it, because you see, these are the four things that happened. Uh, can you do that? There we go. It, it seemed right. It seemed the right thing to do. Okay, so flip, flip over now to the next slide. The, the, go, go next, the next one. Yeah, there we go. So chapter, seven, or chapter 13, 1 Chronicles 13, verse 7. So they moved the ark of God from Abinadad's house on a new car with Uzzah and Ahio guiding it. I mean, David spared no uh, uh, detail. I mean, he was looking at it. He had, he had it on a new car. He had two people watching over it, guiding it. And uh, I, mean, I mean, he was really making sure. And they had the, the singers out there, and this was a... I mean, this was a big deal. And then everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. Verse 9. Next slide. And when they came to the threshing floor of, of uh, Kidon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen stumbled. And Uzzah, what happened? He died. Oh my goodness. He died. I mean, weren't they doing this for God? Didn't they want the presence of God in their midst? What? How could this happen? I mean, I mean, look at the embarrassment that it must have happened to David. I mean, he had 30,000 of his finest men there. There probably was 100,000 people easily. You don't invite 30,000 of your finest and have nobody else show up. <laughs> things happened in David's heart. One, he became angry. And two, he became afraid. And in verse 11, David was angry because the Lord's wrath broke out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah. And the other, verse 12, and David was afraid of God that day and asked, how can I ever bring the ark of God? <laughs> He should have asked that question in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> David became angry and he became afraid. Why did he become angry? The next slide. He could have thought, I am doing this for God. I did my very best. And this is the way you treat me. I want to tell you, say, sometimes that's exactly why people, some people aren't in this church today. Because they got angry with God. Because they said, I'm doing this for you, God. And then this happened. <laughs> How many ever said something like that? <laughs> right? They get angry with God. I, 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 I served you and, and I gave my tithes, even. And then this time. We can spend a lot of energy a lot of time and a lot of money doing something that God never told us to do in the first place. 
and then it doesn't work out the way we expect it, and then we get upset. And then we get angry at God. Now, I know that probably none of you have had that problem, but other churches have that problem all the time. <laughs> Because we, we, uh, we think we're doing something for God. Right? You, you know what I'm saying? And David really thought he was doing something for God. But the problem was, he never sought God in the first place. There was a way to bring back the, the Ark of the Covenant. There was a way to carry that, the Ark. And it wasn't on a new cart. Supposed to carry it on your shoulders. And the priest was supposed to do it. Not the army. The second thing, you know, uh, see David, and this is apropos for Ron today, because we talk about why was he afraid. You see, David was a man who was a shepherd. He was a true shepherd. He loved his sheep, and, and that's why he was a great king, because he was a great shepherd. And David was the one that sang the songs in, in Psalm 18, verse 1 to 6. He says, he said, um, uh, blessed is the Lord. I forgot to, uh, to, uh, to uh, lock my screen. Somehow it's flipping around here because I'm moving around too much. Um, see, I'm still learning. See, it's good to learn. Amen. 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 Um, in uh, Psalm, Psalm 18, verse 1 to 6, he says, he said, uh, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise. I have been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangle me. The torments of destruction overwhelm me. The cords of the grave call around me. The snares of, the de of death confront me in my distress. I call to the Lord, I cry to him, God for help. From his temple he heard my voice, my cry came before him into his ears. You know, this is the way that many of us want God to be. The one who delivers us, the one who protects us, the one who is our rock, the one who is our fortress, the one who is content. Um, that that uh, that one who is always there, we can be content in his midst. And so David understood this. And we sing that. He sings that song out. And then there's this great big mess that David is in because he didn't seek the Lord. I want to say something today that this oxen, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah and Ahio put out their hand to protect the ark. And God struck him down. Does anybody know why God struck him down? And don't say simply because they weren't supposed to touch the ark. Because the ark was holy. And that's why David was afraid. Because all of a sudden, David got a revelation that God was holy. He's holy. He's not the man upstairs. He's holy. Amen. Amen. He's God. He's the King. He's the Lord. He's the Lion of the Hallelujah. tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's not just some person that we can just, you know, call upon whenever we want. When we have tremendous privilege, when we go into His throne, it is an awesome thing to come into God's presence. Amen. Amen. We have uh, made God into this, this everyday thing that is just so common and commonplace. I want to tell you, He is nothing but nothing common about God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. And someday every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that He is the King. Hallelujah. Lord. And people all of a sudden understood this. They said, wait a minute. I'm not the King here. He's the king. And every one in heaven will cry, holy, holy, holy. And David became angry 
And David became afraid. He became angry because he thought, wait a minute, how come I, I did this for you, God? And then suddenly he realized he became afraid because he realized that it wasn't about David. This was about God. And Saints, I want to encourage you today with this, all the angels, they cry out holy day and night. Moses couldn't get into God's promised land. Why? Because he didn't consider God holy. Listen, we have to understand this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. And um, have you got that slide? Yeah, there you go. In Matthew 7, 21, you see, not everyone who calls upon God, and not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. We don't want to preach on this anymore. When I go to a funeral today, every funeral I go to, everyone's going to heaven. <laughs> We have made God so common that He's just like one of us. Good word. Do we want God's presence? <laughs> it's holy. You see, if things don't work out just the way you thought they should and you're angry, then you don't understand God's holiness. Think about that for a minute. Now, I understand it's okay to be angry for a minute. Because you lost something. You realize, oh man, I'm blessed, I've blown it here and I feel really upset. But then we need to move from that to being afraid and saying, God, where have I missed it? I need to seek Him. I need to have God's presence in my life. And Matthew chapter 7 speaks very clearly that we need to hear God's voice. We need to be obedient to what God has called us to. We do not want to hear Him say, I never knew you. Listen, saints, we can go to church all our life. We can have all the trappings. We, can, we don't even need the Holy Spirit anymore. If we just do everything just right. And God is calling us to a different level, right? He wants His presence here in our life. So we skip over to chapter 15 now. And, um, you know, three months have passed since chapter 13. And this chapter 14 is plunked in the middle. And David, and I believe God has plunked chapter 14 to teach us this very lesson. Because chapter 15 starts totally different. Here, he, David calls the priests, <laughs> not the army. He's, this, he's, start, he's now seeking the Lord. He's saying, wait a minute, how am I going to bring this ark in anyway? Yeah. Right? He starts seeking God. And he says, oh, i got to get the priests involved here. i got to get the... I gotta, and you know what? Here's the thing. Did you know that we're all priests now? Oh, we're all priests. We've been all been given the ministry of the priesthood in the New Testament context. That's right. And so it's all our responsibility to bring the presence of God in, the, in our midst. And so David calls them and he, and, and he understands, he says, oh, there's a, there's, a, there's a divine system, there's a way to do this. And so he, he employs it. In, verse, in chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, I've got it, uh, yeah, there it is on the screen. But notice what I've got in yellow there. We blew it because why? No, he begins to make a confession, doesn't he? Humble himself. Oh, I love that. You know, it's okay to make a mistake. But when we make a mistake, we need to acknowledge it before God. And let's go to the next slide. In Romans chapter 12, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world any longer, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. What will happen then? Then you will know <laughs> His will. 
for His perfect and pleasing will. In order for us to know God's perfect and pleasing will, number one, we need to seek God. You see, this is the very issue of some of us. We want God to break through in our life. We want God to come in and we want God to break through, but we don't want to take the time to seek Him. To find out what the principles are. What's going on? You know, if you're, if you're financially strapped and you're seeking God around this issue, it might be that you're spending too much. <laughs> and you can learn about that in the Bible. It talks about how we should spend money. Or it might be that you're too stingy. And it talks about that in the Bible. In other words, or it might be that God has a new direction for you and you're too stubborn to take it. <laughs> in other words, what I'm trying to get at is this. I'm just trying to say, get it practical, right? Say, listen, God wants to break through. He wants His presence to be in our life. But number one, He wants you to seek Him. He wants you to seek Him. Study. Get some understanding. Get some knowledge. Why is it that here we have the most great opportunity in the world to know everything about the Bible and we are the most seemingly, seemingly the most ignorant folks in the world around the Bible? Why is that? Because we, we have not considered, in my opinion anyway, that as God is holy. We just made it commonplace. This is an awesome privilege that you and I have. The fact that he saved you and that you're in this place today, you have an awesome opportunity to get to know God. The second thing is that we need to be obedient to him. You see, this, this you know, or let's just uh, finish off this thought though, because you see, the word of God is inspired. It is useful for everything we had in our life. And, uh, and secondly, you know, God has given us the Holy Spirit. Think about this for a minute. He's given us the Holy Spirit. When He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. We, 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 uh, uh, this, is a, this is a promise that He's given us. He will guide you into all truth. Let me uh, give you a little example of this. How many, maybe uh, one of, uh, or uh, um, my friend Mr. Poacher here, maybe he was there, at Camp at Yak. How many were at Camp at Yak? How many ever went to Yak Camp? Yep. My wife did. Man, I'm glad you're with me, honey. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we used to do Camp at Yak. And uh, Dre and I got there early, and uh, we, uh, uh, just, we were kind of the leaders of it, and, Wanted to get everything organized. Got there early, a day early, and I went out to. Remember, we had the sanctuary uh, out in the open field. Remember that? And uh, and so we. It was awesome. We had a little shelter where the band was under, and, and uh, the congregation was out on, the, on these benches, and the stars were shining on us. And we used to have church up there the, under the sky. Well, I went to the area where we were going to have our church and see get it all ready. And literally, there was a lake of water right there. I mean, I mean, seriously, it was about almost as big as this sanctuary. The the puddle, and it, and the puddle was about this deep of water. And so uh, um, Terry Scott was running the camp at that time, um, the Hayu Ranch. And uh, so I said to Terry, I said, Terry, what do you think's going on here? He says, Well, I there there there's there's some old pipes under the ground and one of them must have busted. And it's bubbling up, you know, from these old pipes. And so we went and surveyed the area and we could not tell at all where this water was coming from. It was just, just couldn't tell. And uh, I thought, I gotta get that cleaned up. That's gotta get drained off before Sunday. We gotta get that pipe fixed or before the campsite. So I went to prayer. 
And I said, Lord, I have no idea where to dig, how we're going to do this. Could you help me? And so the next morning, I got up really early, about, I don't know, 5 or 30 or 6, put on my, my high boots, grabbed the shovel, and I said, Lord, show me where to dig. So I walked into that puddle of water. Didn't have any divine revelation. No lightning from heaven. No word from God. I just prayed. I sought the Lord. And then I obeyed and got that work. Put my shovel down. And I began to dig. And I thought, most of the pipes in the Kootenays are probably about four feet, or I mean two feet deep. So I thought, what I'll do is I'll dig a two-foot square, two feet deep, and then I'll move over. That was my plan of action, and I would just do this until I found the pipes. Well, I dig two feet deep, two foot square, and when I got to about two feet, fling, I hit a metal, <coughs> something metal. And I thought, hallelujah, I hit a pipe. And so then I thought, well, you know, um, I'll clean this two foot out, and I'll tell you what happened. There was a pipe going this way, coming down the, from the creek, and there was a pipe going this way, and the T was where it was leaking, and it was exactly in the middle of my two foot square. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. There was exactly enough room in that two foot square to move a pipe wrench this way to undo that T and to fix it. Hallelujah. I believe in this stuff. Amen. You see, seek the Lord, have it in your heart to obey. <laughs> then go do something. <laughs> You don't need some goosebumps and, and uh, you don't need some hair coming up on the back of your neck or you don't need that lightning bolt. Let's go do something. Lord. So God has given us his word to show us everything we need. He's given us the Holy Spirit to make the word come alive. And then the third thing is he's given us leaders in our life. And it says in, in, um, in Hebrews chapter, uh, wait, where does it say? There we are. Chapter 13, verse 17. Obey those that God has given you. Now, I realize that there has been a little bit of pain in this church. I realize it. I understand it. But saints, the word is still true. Yes. 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 God gives us people in our life to watch over us. <clears throat> and you see, and what, where David went wrong was he looked to the wrong people. Now he needed his officers, amen? But it wasn't the right people for seeking the Lord. And I want to encourage us in this area because you see, now we're inundated with, you know, you can get the best preachers on YouTube. Hey? Yeah. Come on. And, and you, you know, you can turn on, I mean, um, sometimes, you know, if I want to feel inspired, I'll uh, listen to Wayne Cadero, you know, from, uh, from New Hope and uh, in, in uh, Hawaii. And you know, he, he gives a good sermon. But listen, saints. I wanted to, if I wanted to invite Wayne Cadero to my church, I would have to book him two years in advance, and I'd have to pay him $5,000 a session. <clears throat> so just to encourage you, uh, I only need three months advance notice, uh, and, and I only charge a thousand dollars a session. So. You're undercutting. So you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Listen, saints. We need Listen, to break. Saints. <laughs> See, there's a reason why the scripture says, know those who labor among you. Know those. Know those. Now, I'm not belittling Wayne to Darrell, whatever he, you know, whatever he can do or does or whatever, that's his business. But what I'm getting at is this, is that if I want a leader in my life that's watching over me, I want to know who he is or she is. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I want to be able to have access. And I want to be able to judge their character. And I may want to know what their lifestyle is like. Yes. But saints of God, let us never forget that if we want God's presence in our life, we need to seek the Lord. We need to have a heart to obey. And then we need to get involved. And God has given us three safeguards. If David had went to the priests, he never would have got into that trouble. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Instead, he went to his officers. And it's easy to go to the officers because they're the ones that brought him to this place, right? He was successful. So I want to encourage you guys today with this idea that we want God's presence. But what worked in the past was good. But let's find out what God is saying today. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's have a heart to be obedient to what God is calling us to do and then let's get involved. Every single one of us are priests. We all need to get involved. And so then we look at this and we bring it into balance by what does the Word of God say? How is the Holy Spirit directing us? And what are those that God has given leadership in our life? How does that work in our life? Amen? Amen. It's five, ten minutes to twelve. There you go. God bless you real good. Bless you.